Good morning, everybody, and thanks for attending this webinar today. My name is Arthur Henriot. I am a research assistant at France School of Regulation, and I'm going to present the results today of a quantitative study in which we looked in detail at a set of issues related to financing investments in the European electricity transmission grid. Um, all along the presentation, I will focus on delivering the main insight of our study. But if you want more information about our assumptions or calculations or results, you can uh, have a look at the working paper that is available on our website. So during this webinar, I will first uh, introduce the general framework of the study and the nature of the financiability challenge for European TSOs. By financiability, we mean the ability of TSOs to fund their investment program while conserving good financial ratios at the same time. And by good financial ratios, we mean uh, ratios that correspond to an investment grade for rating agencies. We will then analyze together the impact of uh, significant volumes of investment on the long-term sustainability of European TSOs. And finally, we will study a set of potential alternative financing strategies and their impact on uh, tariffs for network users. So let's start now. First of all, what do we mean by challenging volumes of investment? Well, it is common knowledge today that European TSOs will be faced with uh, substantial volumes of investment in the coming decades. On the one hand, uh, new projects are needed to meet demand growth, to connect renewables. On the other hand, a significant part of the existing network must be renewed by 2035. The combination of these two drivers will result in an increased need for sources of financing. There are roughly three ways these investments could be financed. TSOs can first of all fund investment internally by retaining their own earnings. External sources of equity can also be found. And finally, the money can be borrowed from banks. And each of these solutions is unfortunately associated to specific issues. Retained earnings can only increase either if dividends are reduced or if tariffs increase. Regarding equity injection, as most TSOs are still publicly owned today, uh, it, they might be reluctant to open ownership to new investors. But at the same time, uh, at times of a financial crisis, it will be difficult for them to inject the cash needed themselves. And finally, debt. Well, debt has been the favored option since liberalization, yet debt levels are now quite high already. And uh, it is likely that pure debt emission would degrade the financial situation of the TSOs. So balance must be found between these different tools in order to achieve the full investment program. But the financing challenge is only one of the issues faced when uh, considering the whole picture of the investment uh, challenge. One can, for instance, wonder how to identify the investment needs what to build, where to build it, within two countries, within one country, between two countries, uh, and then how to make sure that the required investments are realized at the lowest possible cost. How to make sure that the developers in charge of the projects have the right incentives to behave in an effective and in an efficient way. Another key question is then how to allocate these costs between the different stakeholders and not only how to allocate these costs, but also to allocate these risks. Note that it's not only an issue of uh, equity between the current users of the network, but it's also an issue of equity between different generations of users. So the question you want to answer is whether it is fair that uh, users of the network today will pay for uses made tomorrow by the new generation of users. And finally, there is the point on which we will focus today, which is how to fund these investments. So before going further, I'd like to use one of the opportunities given by the webinar uh, 
which is that I can ask you questions. So I will launch a poll. If you want to, you can uh, pick two answers. The, what are, in your mind, the main challenges faced when uh, developing transmission infrastructure? Is it uh, what to build and where? Is it how to deliver the incentives to TSOs? Is it how to allocate the resulting costs between the different users? Or is it the financeability of this uh, development that is an issue? So I can see that some of you have already started voting. I will give you a couple of seconds and then we will have a look uh, together at the results. So which is the main challenge faced when uh, developing transmission infrastructure. Okay, I will just give you a little bit more time before closing the poll. Okay, I think we can close it now and have a look at it together. Okay, so as you can see, the investment challenge is a very complex one and there are many aspects to be taken into account. Note that for uh, quite a majority of you, uh, the matter of cost allocation is a very tricky one. And there are the, uh, indeed uh, research going on to estimate how costs uh, should be allocated between the different users, between different countries, between different kind of uh, network users. Uh, however, uh, we think, and some of you as well seem to think, that uh, the financeability issue is a serious one. And uh, this is what we will uh, focus on in the rest of the presentation. Okay, so we will now get into the study. We mentioned in the introduction that we define financeability as the ability of TSOs to meet their investment needs while conserving at the same time an investment grade. We adopted in our study the methodology developed by the rating agency Moody's and it's a methodology that has been specially designed to assess the financial situation of regulated electricity networks. And we focused on the quantitative uh, financial ratios that account for 40% of the overall rating made by Moody's. These 40% are divided into two major indicators uh, that uh, reflect respectively the ability of the company to pay interest and the value of the company debt compared to the world value of the company. There are also two minor indicators, but uh, in order to simplify the results, we will focus on the two main indicators. We used uh, data provided by Moody's and a sample of uh, typical TSO profiles to define two standards. Note that both standards correspond to an investment grade, but in the higher standard, the company is uh, slightly more comfortable. Uh, if you want uh, an idea of these standards, the higher one was the one of Red Electrica, the Spanish TSO, and Terna, the Italian TSO, in 2009. The lower standard was the one of REN, the Portuguese TSO, and Statnet, the Norwegian one in 2009. So in this study, financeability is associated to maintaining at least this uh, lower standard while meeting the investment program over the next two decades. Uh, not that we focus uh, on the ENSO-E area, and then when we refer to European TSOs in this study, we mean TSO that are a member of this uh, association of uh, European TSOs. And uh, we picked uh, a mid-term horizon that will extend up to 2030. We considered that uh, in such a geographical area and by such a time period, it would be reasonable to consider a virtual single European TSO for the whole area. So there are obviously differences between the different national or regional entities today, but in the context of uh, increasing European integration, these differences are likely to be more blurred by 2030. So there are already examples of uh, mergers and cross-consolidation of the industry today, and uh, we expect it to even more in the future. Moreover, most of the potential investors and the money lenders are designed on a supranational uh, way. 
So this include uh, it includes global banks, uh, investors like uh, pension funds, sovereign funds, private equity, and it includes supranational financing institutions like the European Investment Bank, for instance. So in our study, it is assumed that money will flow from this pool of investors to an aggregated European TSO, and this single TSO will face the whole investment program of the NSOE area. So as I said, TSOs differ today in terms of ownership, size, investment plans, initial financial situation. Uh, so additional constraints might appear for smaller TSOs that are facing higher investment needs. In this study, we look at the first level of constraints at the scale of the whole European industry. We will see later on that even uh, in such a best case scenario of a perfect cooperation or full integration of European TSOs, it is still possible to identify financing constraints. So now that the frame has been defined, let me introduce you to the business as usual scenario. The first thing we needed was an investment scenario. For new investments, we considered two options. The first one is based on the 10-year network development plan established by ENSO in 2012. As the TYNDP only extends up to 2021, we made the assumption that these uh, investments would uh, remain at the same level up to 2030. The second uh, scenario we took into account for new projects was the one established by the European Commission uh, in the context of the European Commission Roadmap to 2050. So for those who are familiar with the Roadmap, we employed the figures of the current policy initiative scenario until 2030. In addition to these new investments, we also needed a scenario for refurbishing. The International Energy Agency developed in its uh, World Energy Outlook 2011 an analysis of existing transmission networks. So we took the costs provided in this study and we subtracted uh, potential savings made thanks to these new investments. As you can see, the figures related to refurbishing are smaller than the ones related to new projects but still they cannot be neglected, which has sometimes been the case in previous studies. Uh, so I'd like to add that in this presentation, we will only consider the extended TYNDP scenario, complemented with the refurbishing scenario. But uh, if you are interested in this uh, variant, you can find all the results in the working paper I have uh, already mentioned. In addition to this uh, investment program, we also needed uh, basic assumptions for the business as usual financing strategy of TSOs. So we picked what we thought would represent average standard values. As TSOs typically distribute a large share of their profits, as dividends, we chose a high dividend payout ratio of 70%. The initial return of assets was set to 7.5% so that tariffs in the first year would match uh, in our model and in reality. And in addition, we considered a standard assumption of uh, tariffs increasing by roughly 1% a year in addition to inflation. And this uh, figure reflects the past trends uh, in the NSOE area over the last couple of years. We also considered that the uh, total lack of equity injection was uh, adequate to reflect current trends. So the investments uh, made by TSOs have traditionally been funded by debt since liberalization. As a result, the initial carrying is quite high today for the aggregated European TSO, and it is already close to 60%. Note that this uh, figure still fits what we define as the higher standard in our introduction. So then we took this uh, business as usual scenario and we ran it over the next two decades in a balance sheet model. And the results were quite clear. Such a scenario is not viable and it would lead to a quick and severe degradation of the TSO's financial profile within 10 years. 
And remember that this is the best case scenario of perfect uh, cooperation between the different TSOs. As a consequence, uh, we asked ourselves another question, which was, since it is not possible to achieve 100% of this investment program, what is the share that is achievable? We considered uh, our standard assumption of uh, tariffs increasing by 1% a year. And results were quite again quite clear. According to our calculations, only half the planned TYNDP investment program could be achievable. This will correspond to a return on equity of 7.2%. So there will therefore be a financing gap roughly equal to half the investment needs. Note that uh, in any case, uh, it is impossible to, for European users to maintain the higher standard today, as the burden of the debt is already too important for current level of tariffs. So I would like now to ask you one more question. This figure of 47% uh, might seem impressive, but to your mind, is it really that bad? After all, projects delivery are subject to many other sources of delay, uh, can be licensing, permitting. Uh, so do you think that these other constraints would anyway not allow more than half the investment program to take place? In other words, is this 50% uh, financing gap really impacting projects delivery? Yes, this would be a safe, uh, an important constraint for projects delivery. Or no, there are anyway many other reasons why uh, projects would not be delivered. So I will now launch the second poll, and once again you will be given the opportunity to give your opinion on this matter. So you should be able to vote by now. This time you can uh, pick only one answer. Okay, I can see that you are voting much faster. These are quite uh, interesting results. I will give you just a little bit more time to give your opinion on this matter. Is the financing gap a significant constraint? Yes or no? Okay, I think we can close the poll by now. So I will close it. We can have a look at the results together. So as you can see, these results are uh, quite mixed. It is clear that there are many reasons for which uh, projects would be delayed anyway, and uh, permitting and the time necessary to obtain the licenses needed is a significant one. But according to a slight majority of you, this uh, investment gap, this financing gap, would have a significant impact on project delivery. And uh, what we will look at in the rest of the study is uh, whether there are solutions available to fill this gap. So we will now go back to the study. So it seems clear from our uh, previous results that under this uh, business as usual assumptions, the investment program will not be financeable. The main reason for this is that uh, sub substantial needs for funding can be based on pure debt financing. If we want to achieve 100% of the investment program, we have to balance debt with uh, sources of equity, either internally or externally. There are three natural variants that uh, come to mind to increase the share of equity. The first uh, solution is to increase the share of retained earnings. It's possible to do so either by keeping the same share of a higher volume of earnings or by keeping a higher share of the same volume of earnings. So the first option corresponds to higher tariffs paid by consumer and the second option corresponds to a, a lower dividends uh, emitted to investors every year. Finally, the third variant is to find the external sources of equity. So now we will have a look at these uh, different options and assess their potential for releasing the pressure on consumers. The first simple option is to increase tariffs until uh, revenues are sufficient to ratio money lenders. 
I'd like to remind you that the current trade in tariffs for the MSOE area is an annual increase of roughly 1% a year in addition to inflation. We calculated that in order to achieve the World TYNDP program, uh, while conserving an investment grade, an annual increase of 3.4% a year will be needed. Note that this is a significant increase compared to the current trends. If we have a look in further details at this evolution, so we now look at the evolution of uh, network tariffs between 2012 and 2013. You can see that uh, while these tariffs almost double between 2012 and 2013, most of this increase is due to the increase of depreciation payments and interest payments. The reason why this uh, figure is quite interesting is because these two components result mechanically from uh, higher capital expenditure. Depreciation is a direct consequence of higher capital expenditures and can barely be avoided. And uh, interest payment of debt, well, if interest payments are to decrease, they must be replaced by uh, other ways of uh, paying for capital, which would be, for instance, dividends. So when you look at this figure, you can already see that the margin to reduce the impact on tariffs, for instance, by uh, increasing OPEX efficiency or uh, by retaining less earnings, is quite limited. Uh, you now know that uh, I have only prepared half a presentation, so I would like uh, to ask you once more to contribute to the study. Such a rise might seem impressive, but after all, Transmission tariffs are only a small share of the total tariffs, of the overall tariffs paid by consumers, by network users. So consumers might not see this increase. Moreover, as uh, significant goals, goals are imposed on TSOs, it is only natural that uh, tariffs must rise. So maybe consumers will be able to understand that uh, tariffs have to increase. But we all know that uh, consumers usually don't like uh, increase in tariffs, that it might be seen as uh, bad management, as poor efficiency. So they might not be so happy to see this tariff increase and they might not understand it. So I would like now to ask you one more question, which is to your mind. Uh, would such a rise in tariffs be acceptable? Yes, because consumers will not see this increase in tariffs. Yes, because consumers are grown up and they are able to understand that tariffs have to increase. Or no, because this increase in tariff will not be seen as uh, something resulting from ironies, but it will be seen as a result of poor efficiency. Okay, so I will now leave you a little bit more time to answer this question. What do you think? Do you think that such a rise would be acceptable? Yes or no? And if yes, for which reason? We'll just give you a little bit more time and I will now close the poll and we will have a look at the results. Okay. If the participation rate is quite high for this one. Okay. So now let's look at the results. Well, once again, the answer is quite mixed. What is interesting is that uh, for most of you, Consumers are not able to understand this uh, increase in tariffs. And the only reason for which they would accept it is because they don't see it. Uh, but uh, let's pretend that consumers are not that blind, that they will see these figures. And let's see if we can uh, find ways to lower the impact of uh, network tariffs. We will now go back to the final part of the presentation. So we mentioned that there could be more innovative uh, solutions to release the pressure on TSOs. As there is a drastic change in the nature of investments, uh, there might be a need for a shift of the business model. Maybe the current business model is not adapted to the new needs. So we wondered what would be the share of the TYNDP achievable for alternative financing strategies. We keep our assumption of uh, increase in tariffs limited to 1% a year. Remember that uh, in our business as usual scenario, only 47% of the total program could be achieved. We consider two alternative financing strategies. The first one is to lower the dividend payout ratio 
from 70% in our business as usual scenario to 30% in this new hypothesis. And uh, the second alternative financing strategy we took into account was to finance 50% of the financing needs by injecting equity. So I'd like to remind you that in our business as usual scenario, we have no equity injection at all, 0%. Well, when you look at the share of the investment program that is achievable, you can see that it is indeed possible for the same rise in tariffs to fund a higher share of the investment package. But when you look in further details at the consequences of this uh, of these investments, you can see that the return provided to investors is reduced mechanically. Uh, when these uh, financing strategies are considered. So, if we just look at alternative financing strategies uh, in a rough way with the same increase in tariff, we can see that it is unlikely that uh, this higher need for equity will be compatible with a lower return on equity. It seems that uh, one way or the other, tariffs will have to increase uh, if the uh, world investment program is to be met. But maybe they do not have to increase that much. So this is what we will look at now. What is the rise in tariffs required to achieve the world investment program for these alternative financing strategies? There is a trade of faced when injecting equity. It might allow to release constraints on financial ratios, uh, uh, because it uh, really is constraints of the burden of the debt and the interest payments. But equity also typically requires a higher return, which has to be covered by an increase in revenues. What we did was to look at the rise in tariffs required to maintain a stable return on equity for different uh, share of equity injections. It appears that the optimum point is found for a relatively low amount of equity injection. In the case of a 10% return on equity, 5 billion will be needed by 2030. And in the case of the 8% return on equity, uh, the optimum point is found for uh, 10 billion equity injection by 2030. So there are a lot of numbers in this figure, but uh, what can we take from it? Well, first of all, it is indeed possible to achieve the world investment program with a lower impact on tariffs for the same return on equity. And the good news is that the uh, optimum point is found for relatively small amount of equity injections. These are reasonable amounts. But, I mean, it's only half good news because we can see that the, even in the best case, the annual growth in tariffs will still be something like 2.9% a year, which is still much more than the current trends of 1% uh, a year. So tariffs will have to rise significantly anyway with this alternative financing strategy. The results are quite similar when considering the other financing strategy, which is to reduce dividends. So once again, it is possible to achieve uh, the world investment program at lower costs if the dividend payout ratio is reduced. Uh, and it is possible to do so for a relatively high dividend payout ratio. Note that there is an additional complexity in this case because while the return on equity is kept constant, the share of this return of equity that is perceived as dividends is changing. And it is not clear whether uh, investors will appreciate to receive uh, their return uh, by holding share for a long time instead of uh, receiving it as cash on an annual basis. But once again, it is possible to achieve a world investment program at lower costs for reasonable dividend payout ratio. Uh, and once again, it's not, uh, there is no miracle solution and uh, tariffs will have to rise significantly anyway. So the study is quite technical, 
and there are a lot of figures, it has been a bit dense, but now I would like to take a step back and see what we can conclude from these numbers. First of all, there is a financeability issue. Even if ways are found to identify investments, to allocate the cost, to deliver the right incentives to TSO, uh, significantly higher investment needs would be a source of constraint for TSOs. Of course, this 50% uh, figure depends on our assumptions, and it may be in the end 35% or 65%, but in any case, there will be a significant financing gap. We've seen that there are several ways to solve such a gap. In this study, we focused on uh, quantitative financial metrics, but the regulatory framework can be adapted uh, to provide further certainty to investors and to make a higher volume of debt acceptable. We've seen that uh, if uh, higher tariffs were employed, a threefold faster increase than current rates would be required. We have, uh, we have also seen that uh, alternative financing strategies could be used. We showed that it was uh, possible to reduce the required increase in tariffs, but that, uh, however, in any case, uh, tariffs would still have to increase significantly. Another question we mentioned but did not really cover is the acceptability by investors of new financing strategies, of new business models. Uh, to what extent will uh, investors accept these changes? Does it, does it mean that the traditional investors will accept the changes? Does it mean that uh, new investors will replace traditional investors? And how willing will uh, current owners be to open ownership to new investors? Before answering question, I would like to insist on the fact that our study focused on quantitative ratios, but there are many other qualitative factors that are taken into account by investors. So, for instance, this is an abstract from a recent article in the Financial Times commenting on the financial profile of SNAM, an Italian gas TSO. If you read this uh, abstract, you will see that uh, SNAM's debt is, according to the financial times, quite high, but that on the other hand, it's not so bad because the earnings are visible, dividend looks secure, and the balance sheet looks robust. The reason why I quoted this uh, article is not because I want you to know everything about SNAM's financial profile but it's because it shows the importance of visibility and transparency of a company's actions. We've seen that quantitative ratings that we used in this study only account for 40% of the overall assessment made by retailing agencies. The rest, the remaining 60%, are all about stability and visibility. Investor, investors perceive signals in choices made by companies. And what is really important is that uh, investors get the feeling that the money is well employed, that these financial needs are not the result of poor management of or low efficiency. And the kind of signals you typically want to avoid are these ones. How do you avoid these kind of signals? Well, you have to make clear that money is spent to add value to the company. In the particular case of regulated TSOs, it means that the regulatory framework must be stable or at least predictable enough. It also means that the development of uh, complementary generation assets must be predictable enough. And at times when the development of the generation assets is driven by the European energy policy, it implies that this policy must be credible enough. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, you can find both the working paper and the associated policy brief on our website. Uh, you will find there are more details about assumptions, calculations, and uh, additional results. And I uh, will be now very happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Artur, for your presentation. And before we will start the Q&A, I would like to just say that uh, on the computer screen you can see Artur's email. Therefore, if you have any questions after the webinar, you can always contact him directly. And let's now go very quickly to the Q&A. And the first question is actually a question asked uh, during our previous webinar, because this is the third time we are organizing the same webinar. And this question was very interesting, and it uh, 
it tackled some issues that can be also interesting for our today's audience. Therefore, Arthur, I will ask you this question again. Um, so here it is. When you talk about increasing tariffs, what is your assumption about the amount of transmitted energy? Is it increasing? Is it constant? Etc. Okay, so yeah, it is true that the sensitivity of our uh, assumptions and of our results to the evolution of uh, load is, a, is an important one. Uh, there are many consequences uh, that could uh, result from a lower demand than expected. First of all, I'd like to say that in our study, our basic assumption for demand evolution was based on the TYNDP because we wanted to keep a consistency between the investment needs and the consumption evol evolution. Uh, there are several effects resulting from uh, an evolution of demand. We are at times of crisis, so we know that consumption may be lower than expected. Well, on the one hand, it is uh, a relief for uh, TSOs because it means that uh, as needs are lower than expected, the investment need might also be lower than expected. However, uh, for those of you who know the TYNDP, you know that 80% of the investments identified are not the result of uh, an evolution of demand, but 80% of these uh, bottlenecks are due to connect, are necessary to connect renewables. So this uh, impact on uh, investments may not be as high as expected. The other very important consequences is that uh, if you have less network users that are paying for the same investment needs, then of course we have to pay higher tariffs. When we made a sensitivity analysis of our results, uh, taking into account different uh, load evolution, we saw that uh, if uh, load was lower than expected, it would result in a further increase of uh, tariffs. So it might not be such a good news that uh, demand will be lower than expected. Okay, thank you very much, Arthur, for clarifying uh, this issue. And now we go straight to the questions submitted by our today's audience. And the first question will be, can you indicate for each extreme scenario what fraction of the financing gap was provided by the tariff? Okay, so when you, even in case of these uh, alternative financing strategies, uh, the resulting needs are provided by uh, the tariffs. So, for instance, in the case where you have a higher equity injection, you still pay dividends uh, to investors. So, it's not really that uh, equity injection are a gift that uh, is a uh, considered independently from, uh, from the tariff evolution. What happens when you use these uh, alternative financing strategies is that you can uh, release the pressure on financial ratios at lower cost. The reason for this is, for instance, that if you have uh, lower interest payments resulting from a lower debt, then uh, you don't need as high earnings to reassure investors that it will be possible to pay these interest payments. So it's not really, uh, when you have equity injection, for instance, it's not really filling part of the gap, it's just uh, making it easier for tariffs to fill the gap. Um, I'm sure that you can find more detailed and uh, clear explanations in the working paper. It's a uh, it may be difficult to get this point uh, so quickly, but uh, you should uh, have a look at the working paper to find more explanations. Okay, um, and the next question is very brief. I hope that it will be clear enough. Uh, how is the result of the study affected by the way a TSO recover money? I'm not sure I get uh, this point. I mean, what huh. is uh, the assumption made in our study is that uh, TSOs get uh, their return based on the regulated asset base. So there is no incentives for efficiency. Uh, for those who are a bit familiar with the regulatory world, uh, we make the assumption of uh, costs directly passed to 
consumers. There is no thing such as a, a price cap or a cost plus regulation. We, the assumptions we made is that in any case, whatever the way, whatever is the way picked to remunerate TSOs, the idea is that this solution has to give uh, TSOs a satisfactory return. We didn't make any assumption about uh, incentives to efficiency because this is something that uh, comes in addition to this issue. So if you can make TSOs more efficient, if you can lower the cost of investment, then the investment challenge it, it will be less significant. But what we wanted to see would be that if these investment costs is, uh, identified by TSOs are the baseline, what is the costs paid by consumers necessary to ensure that these investments are provided with a satisfactory rate of return? And this rate of return and the money paid by consumers is not related to the way TSOs are remunerated. So there will not be significant differences for different ways of uh, remunerating TSOs. What can happen is that uh, if uh, more uh, risky ways are picked to remunerate TSOs, then the premium required by uh, investors might be more, might be higher. It means that the return on equity we identified might not be sufficient for some remuneration schemes. Thank you, Arthur. I think that we have time for a last question. This question has two parts, um, so I will read it to you right now slowly. Uh, does the study assume a similar investment risk for the refurbishment investment and the 10-year network development plan investment? The latter probably have a higher risk profile. How would this impact the results? Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a good question as well. So. To keep the study simple, we did not consider different assumptions on the investments needed for refurbishing and uh, new projects. Uh, this would have required a much more complex uh, analysis of uh, the risk profile of investments. What we considered in our study once again was that investments would get a uh, regulated rate of return, whatever their final efficiency. The, uh, as you probably understood in this presentation, all these investment uh, volumes have been taken as exogenous assumptions, so they, do not, they are not related to the financial profile of the TSOs, or there is no interaction between them. It's uh, direct input in the study. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Artur. I think that we are running out of time. Uh, there were some comments uh, still submitted, but I would advise you to contact Artur after the webinar to clarify that. Um, so, Artur, thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a wonderful day. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you, Magda, and uh, thanks everybody for attending and for the interesting questions, and I would be very pleased to answer any further comments received by email. Mm -hmm.